Uh, hi, so I'm Sophia Dantuan, and uh, this past year at, at RPI, my master's research focused on using processor optimization uh, as a side channel tech. So that's what I'll be talking about today. So it all begins in the cloud. And everyone here probably knows what the cloud is and how it, how it works, but you can kind of see in this diagram the basic concepts. You have virtual instances all resting on top of shared hardware. Um, and that shared hardware is allocated to the virtual instances by the hypervisor. So the resource, resources are allocated by the hypervisor, goes up to be given to the operating systems. And this is the dynamic allocation uh, which causes everyone to save money, which is why the cloud's great and everyone's happy. Uh, so there are some problems with this setup, though, and a lot of you are probably familiar with the basic ones. Um, your sensitive data is stored remotely, so you don't have control over uh, you know, the physical box that it's resting on. Uh, also, the host that you're you know, sharing your data with might be vulnerable itself or untrustable, and these are all issues. Uh, but the one I'm focusing on is the fact that you are co-located on the same machine with virtual machines which um, you don't control and you really have no, no idea of what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of this depiction on the right Obviously, the black VM is the malicious VM in this situation, um, but they're sharing that hardware, as you can see beneath. Um, so it's this physical co-location, which I'm using to uh, create a side channel. All right, so again, we have the cloud hardware, um, and you can see it, the hypervisor is giving the physical resources on the bottom uh, up to the operating systems above, and the operating system actually just sees that chunk that it's allocated. I'm at that one moment in time. So these virtual allocations might actually be different uh, over a period of time. And the, the operating system can see those changes. So it's this translation between the physical and the virtual uh, based on need, which is what we're attacking here. Um, and it's this allocation which causes contention between machines. So if there's only a finite amount of physical resource, uh, then the operating systems can only you know, receive a finite amount of virtual allocation of these physical resources. Um, so this also means that your private VM's activities are not opaque to other VMs. So if um, your VM demands all of the physical resource available, then in a very poorly um, set up system where the hypervisor just gives it to you, um, all the other VMs would see that they don't have anything left for, uh, to use. All right, so this is just an overview of my talk today. And right now I'm just gonna go into uh, kind of basic generic ways you can use um, this contention uh, to create side channels. So uh, you might have heard side channel text in reference to cryptography. And in cryptography, it refers to anything uh, or any information you can gain from a system by recording the environment on which that crypto system is implemented. So. Um, in the cloud, it's kind of similar because it's a hardware-based side channel. Um, so you treat the VM like a black box almost, right? So you can't really see into someone else's VM. You can't see what they're doing inside. Um, but you can see how they interact with uh, the surrounding environment that you're both sharing. Um, so it's cross-VM. So obviously you have to have co-location. Your VM has to be sharing the same resources in order to record the environmental changes which that black box VM that you're targeting um, is causing. And these changes that you're recording have to be reliable and also uh, uh, recordable, right? So um, you have to be able to reliably uh, record these through time and know that you're gonna get certain averages or certain patterns in that system. So it does require um, kind of aggregate data and statistical analysis on top of it. So this is a generic model of how this side channel attack, or a hardware side channel attack would look in the cloud. So you're having that shared hardware being used as that medium which you're recording things from. Um, the transmitter or the victim, in most cases, is just causing artifacts in the system to be, to be there, right? So it's operating normally, it's doing whatever things it needs to do, and it's leaving changes in that shared hardware beneath. And those changes then are recorded through the receiver that you see to the right. Uh, so that would just be a generic uh, model of how this would work, and this can be 
um, kind of applied to any hardware unit that you're attacking, be that the cache or the pipeline um, or the system buses, anything. Um, so using this system, we can kind of break it up into three different categories of possible exploitation avenues, right? So if we're just receiving information from the system, just recording, uh, we can do such things as crypto key theft, which is a very common one in academic literature, used to prove that a side channel attack works. Um, but in this situation, uh, the transmitter is the victim. It doesn't know that it's transmitting into the system. So the only adversary here is the receiver. Um, so someone who's just reading information from the system. Um, so you can do things like crypto key theft. Um, environmental keying is also a very strong one. However, it's not actually um, researched a lot in academia, right? So uh, if you're able to reliably get specific patterns um, attached to one machine, one physical device, uh, you can do things like have your malware only be deployed on certain hardware um, or other things like that. Now on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have just the transmitter. So someone who doesn't know who else it's co-located with, but it's just transmitting information or artifacts onto the shared hardware. Um, and so a common one that can be applied here is something like a denial of service attack. So if you're using all of the cache or if you're repeatedly using the processor um, for high, um, for large computations, then you're causing denial of service or a decrease in performance to the other VMs around you. And that's kind of just a generic, um, not very uh, finite one, but um, it does cover a lot. And finally, uh, what most people think of when they think of side channel attacks is something like a communication network. Um, but if both the transmitter and the receiver know that they're co-located and that uh, they're both transmitting and receiving across the same hardware, then you can create this a channel. So what most people think of as a communication channel or a side channel. Um, and that could be used to exfiltrate data from one box into another or uh, communicate covertly with anyone else knowing. And this is how that would look, just a simple diagram. Um, you have your medium being the hardware, so that's uh, that shared physical resource. And uh, the virtual machines above are just repeatedly using that to force artifacts into that shared hardware and receiving them. And most of the time this has to be done in time frames or in time intervals because uh, the allocations from that shared hardware do change over time um, up to the virtual allocations in the VM. All right, so now I'm just going to go over a simple example of a more common side channel attack in the cloud is through the cache. It's actually um, the most popular because it is the easiest to employ, uh, mostly because the cache, it's memory. So it's easier to store value in memory and record it later. You don't have to worry about that um, being replaced or just being uh, removed immediately, like you do in the pipeline where instructions are continuously moving. So in this example, it's called the flush and reload attack. Uh, it's targeting the L3 cache tier, but uh, you could do similar things in the different cache tiers as well. Um, the receiver or the adversary is actually simply flushing the cache and querying it at specific lines. So predetermined lines, but um, specific lines. And in between that flush and the query, uh, the transmitter or the victim, which is unknowingly transmitting artifacts into the cache, uh, is accessing that same shared line of L3 cache. And because of this, uh, they were able to leak a new PG private key um, from the system. So uh, they proved that their side channel was effective by doing um, one of the, the one example I talked about earlier being the crypto key theft. Um, but if you want to read more about that attack, uh, it's on my website at that URL. Um, but this is just an example of a more common uh, memory-based uh, side channel attack. But like I was saying earlier, the pipeline is actually harder to attack than the cache or than the memory units because of the fact that uh, there is no ability to really query into the pipeline. Again, it's like a black box, right? You can't query into the pipeline and say, what instructions are you executing now, right? Because if you did that, you'd alter the pipeline. Um, and so you, all you really have with the pipeline is um, a few benefits, even though it is harder to attack. Um, it's a quieter covert channel, mostly because it's harder to detect when someone's misusing it, 
um, for the same reasons that it's hard to use it to communicate over. Um, and it's also not affected by cache misses and other such things which um, affect the, um, which affect other side channels in memory um, due to the large frequency of, of traffic in the cloud. Um, and the noise in the environment um, in the cloud, so there's tons of processes going on all the time, actually amplifies this channel instead of decreasing, decreasing it, which is what happens in cache-based side channels. Um, so how are we doing this? How are we targeting the pipeline, even though it's harder? Um, well, this is what we want to do. We want to create a side channel uh, to exploit these inherent properties of shared hardware um, with the fact that we know we're on a cloud system. So we have to use properties of both of these things, the hardware and the fact that we know we're sharing. Um, so we know that we're sharing hardware. OK, great, that's the cloud. We have that. Uh, dynamically allocated hardware resources, all right, we have that too. Um, but we also have to know we're co-located with our victim or our, our colluding VMs. And that's one that's a little harder to prove. There has been literature on this. I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but we're assuming that moving forward. All right, so we chose to target the processor and specifically the pipeline um, for this attack. And uh, we know that we have to have some sort of new way to query artifacts from this hardware dynamically. So we can't just query a line in cache, right? We can't just say, hey, what value is here? Um, so we, all we know is we can give the pipeline an instruction set order. So our process is instruction set in a certain order and feed it to the pipeline. And uh, we know that we can get the res results from the instruction set at the end of the execution. So when the processor is finishing executing it, it feeds us back the results and we have those. And those are the only two things we know. So the only uh, thing that we, we thought we could do the easiest way to determine the state of the pipeline, even though it is like the black box, right, um, is we have to know that the pipeline reordered our instructions uh, based on the results or the returning values of these instruction sets. Um, so we're targeting out-of-order execution. And uh, this is how we set it up. This is what we wanted. Um, we wanted some VMs up here, and they're running processes. Those processes are sharing pipelines um, down here. Um, so simultaneous multi-threading is turned on in this case, so the processes are sharing the pipeline at the same time. And uh, one scary thing that um, we did note is that your, your process's private instructions are being executed in the same pool as everyone else's in the same pipeline. And the pipeline has no clue where the instructions came from. So to receive uh, information or to receive artifacts from the pipeline, we want to be able to record out-of-order executions. So we want to be able to know when the processor uh, reordered our instruction sets that we gave it based on the returning values. Um, so like any good presentation, we have a picture of the Intel manual. And uh, basically this is just telling us that the out-of-order execution case is possible um, by giving us this simple example. Um, and an easier way to visualize it is this. Um, you have two threads running, and there's a store and a load. And the stores and the loads aren't dependent on each other inside the thread, but in between threads they are. So you're storing one to memory here and loading it in the opposite thread. Now in the ideal world where the threads are you know, si synced and simultaneous, um, R2 and R1 are both going to be one in this case. In the asynced example, which is the one that's most common, uh, one thread goes a bit faster than the other, and you end up with one uh, variable being one and one variable being zero. But now in the final case, the one that the Intel manual is talking about, the out-of-order case, um, the processor determines that the loads and the stores aren't dependent on each other and puts the loads right before the stores. In this case, R1 and R2 are zero, and that's the case that we're recording. Um, this is just the pseudocode for what our receiver looks like. Uh, we just have a huge loop, two threads running in that loop, and every time we come across a case in a specific time frame, we know that that was an out-of-order execution, and we, we increment. So we end up with uh, averages in certain time frames, um, and those averages will tell us if the out-of-order execution frequency was higher or lower in that time frame, and that represents a bit of information. Now, this doesn't really mean anything unless we can affect the way the out-of-order execution averages um, occur, 
right? So if we can't affect it and we don't know how that changes, then there's no reason that to any of this. Um, but we know we can actually affect uh, processor reordering and optimization by using memory fences. Um, and everyone here is probably pretty familiar with uh, the x86 instruction M fence, but that's what we use. Even though it's a pretty expensive operation, uh, 100 cycles per operation, um, it does what we want, and it basically tells the processor or the pipeline to um, keep the stores in front of the loads. And this will, uh, when injected in the same pipeline as our processes threads, will decrease the uh, recorded average of out of order executions for that time frame. So the stores will happen before the loads, uh, everything will look normal, and our out of order execution count will decrease for that time frame. Um, so now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, memory models here. Um, there's two types of memory reordering, compile time and runtime. And obviously here we're talking about runtime uh, optimization in the pipeline, so your instructions are already compiled, they're being executed and optimized. We're also targeting the x86 uh, system, so that means it's usually strong. Uh, this basically means that for the most part, the CPU is right in its optimization, and uh, for the most part, our code's gonna execute fine. But um, in certain cases, there will be reordering, and that's, that's great for us, that's what we're targeting. Um, now in different systems, when there's even weaker um, when there's either, even weaker memory models, our out-of-order execution channel actually increases in amplitude, so it's amplified. But in systems like this, when there is absolutely no uh, reordering allowed, then obviously our channel is mitigated. So, so there's four different types of uh, memory reordering barriers, and I just thought I'd go over uh, the four options you have. You can stop loads and loads from being reordered, load stores, et cetera. Um, and obviously, uh, based on what I was saying earlier, I'm just preventing the store load from occurring, uh, or optimization from occurring. So I'm maintaining the stores before the loads. Um, all right, so we're forcing out of order executions, those patterns to decrease um, on simultaneous multi-threaded systems um, by preventing uh, the out-of-order execution case by using the store load memory barrier, using the mfence instruction. Um, and this is, again, just going over what we're doing to transmit. Um, but we're forcing these patterns, and these patterns are what uh, will give us meaning from the system. So these patterns of out-of-order executions and time frames, uh, we can then map to different activities in the system um, that the, the VM might be doing. And uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, if we can force uh, another process's uh, execution path to be changed because we're inserting different instructions which affect optimization, um, that could be good too. All right, so uh, how are we actually designing our channel? Well, in our lab setup, we had Zen Hypervisor because that, that is the most popular commercial uh, platform, Xeon processors, uh, shared hardware, and four cores with six VMs. And SMT was turned on, like I said. Uh, the attack does not work, actually, if SMT is not turned on. Uh, specifically, we're running six Windows 7 VMs uh, with just noisy processes going on to mimic the cloud environment. Um, and the two VMs that we were using as a sender and receiver um, were just uh, operating different processes at the same time, and they were sharing the same pipeline here. All right, so um, for the demonstration, uh, I think you'll be able to access these two files. Uh, if you can't actually, um, just come up to me afterwards and I can share the code with you. Um, so this was my setup. Uh, this is just Zen Center. It's the easiest way to get on a Zen server. Um, but this is uh, the same setup um, obviously, <laughs> I had it at Recon as well. But uh, there is, are six VMs, all Windows 7. And you can see that they're all pretty much the same. Um, they're clones of each other, so they're sharing, um, they're sharing the same uh, senders and receivers that we talked about earlier. So in the first VM, um, we're gonna start our receiver and just take a baseline count of, of the system. 
And so uh, I, we had a simple algorithm to uh, map the patterns that we received to bits. And in this case, nothing's being transmitted, so all zeros, um, and which is fine. That's what we want, because nothing is being forced. Just the noisy operations are going on. And that's kind of cool, because it shows that uh, when we do record enough information from a system, we can actually, uh, we can actually um, average out the noise from the system. And I, I graphed it here. And so you can see that even though in each time frame uh, the averages were a bit different, for the most part, they were all pretty low. All right, and then part of the tool I wrote for this, which is available on my website as well, um, prints that into a file if you want to actually see the number of out-of-order executions you're recording from the pipeline. Um, so for my transmitter, I'm just entering the binary string that I want to send. Um, and in this example, I'm just going to send uh, two bits. And in the VM that's listening, I want to be able to, um, let's say, in this example, I, I have doing nothing for two bits. And then when it receives three, it will, um, it will launch an attack. So uh, in this example, um, so the idea was that uh, there would be some rootkit or malware already on that, that system, and when it received the trigger signal, uh, in this case, it would blue screen the Windows, Windows box, but you, know, you could do something a bit more covert. All right, so in conclusion, um, like any good research paper, we had potential mitigation techniques. Um, so you could isolate your VMs, turn off hyper-threading, um, and then also do a, um, so the first two are pretty, uh, they're pretty invasive, right? So that's probably something you don't want to do if you're running a lot of, a lot of VMs. But uh, you could do things like blacklist uh, resource sharing between v, uh, threads from different VMs um, or else things like that. Um, but like, like I said, the downsides to using any of these mitigation techniques are that um, a lot of benefits from using the cloud um, would be mitigated. So they would be also um, removed. Um, so our research, we, our contributions to literature, I guess, we demonstrated a novel out-of-order execution side channel. Um, and we showed how even though most side channels target more static memory models, um, it is possible to create side channels over more dynamic systems by um, dy dynamically querying them, like I showed earlier with out-of-order execution. Um, so I'd like to thank Jeremy Blackthorne from Lincoln Labs for introducing me to this topic. Uh, my CTF team, RPISEC, and uh, Trilla Bits. So if there's any questions, I can take them now, or you can contact me, um, any of these places would work. And also the, my thesis on this subject where I demonstrate uh, not, not just the one attack, but the ones I, all, I listed before, um, it was in my thesis. So if you want to read re my results from that, you can go, go there. Yep, thank you. Oh, can you repeat the question on the microphone? Uh, did you ever see any uh, out-of-order execution on the receiving side uh, that actually would be not when you're receiving in the process, but just in normal execution, like in cause like a failure or a crash? Uh, no, so um, I guess we're talking about noise from the system, right? So obviously you're gonna receive out-of-order executions um, even if nothing's being transmitted, because that just happens normally. Um, but the averages will be different, so you can um, take those into account when you create your communication algorithm or something like that. Um, yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the bandwidth is pretty good. Um, I have the different table. I have different bandwidths for different optimization levels. Uh, that's my thesis. It's like in a in a chart. If you want to read that, but 
Um, for the most part, it is a little slower just because we didn't try and optimize it. Um, we felt that it'd be more interesting to pursue different techniques that you could use with it. But, um, but yeah, that's probably an area for further research, so. Excuse me? Uh, are there countermeasures against these types of attacks? Uh, I'm not sure. Um... Uh, yeah, I had a slide about that a few slides ago, but um, yeah. Uh, so the obvious ones are the ones that you probably don't want to use. Um, because they, they would mitigate, uh, or they would remove any benefits you get from using the cloud. Um, but there are things you can do at the hypervisor level, so at very low level software. Um, but those are ones that I haven't fully, I'm working on those right now, so I haven't fully developed them, but we, we can talk after. Okay. All right, yeah, if there's no other questions, then um, just come up if you want afterwards. So.